uh, Evacta for inviting me to give this webinar. Well, these two webinars. Uh, so, um, yeah, I'm speaking to you from a lovely sunny Ayrshire at the moment. Um, uh, although our practice is in Glasgow, this is uh, this is home for me, and I'm cur currently like perhaps some of some of you furloughed at the moment because our practice has had a significant reduction in caseload. Not surprisingly, um, and uh, I I worked for a month in April, and then one of the other vets, Hillary, has taken over for me for the month of May. So I'm having a longer break than I'm, than I've ever had, actually. Um, so yeah, I just really want to start by acknowledging this um, that we live in a very different world now uh, for the last two months. And um, there have been some huge changes in the way uh, veterinary practice is working um, and we're all having to adapt uh, to this very different world. Um, and I think that quite rightly, initially in veterinary practice, um, certainly in small animal practice and in, and in our practice, the initial focus really was um, after the, the, the first lockdown was on providing an emergency service uh, for emergency and you know, severely affected cases, kind of first aid treatment really. But I think now there's a recognition that this is a this uh, situation that we're currently in is is going to become normal. It's something that we're all going to have to adapt to, um, and that we've got to move on now from just managing uh, emergency uh, cases to providing a service to support, at the very least, support. Um, all our animal patients with with chronic disease um, and in particular you know certainly in, within dermatology uh, many of the cases that we deal with are chronic and require ongoing support um, and this is what we've been uh, trying to do over the last couple of months in our practice and I just want to share with you some of the things that that, that we've been doing um, to uh, adapt to this new world. So um, I, for us, we're really looking at, you know, we're, we're looking at how can we manage uh, these chronic diseases over the long term, not just over the short period of maybe a dog has a flare up with the allergy and requires some short term treatment. But what we're trying to do is to avoid um, these chronic diseases becoming poorly managed and ending up as uh, cases that are much more difficult to control with very severe um, problems and ultimately become major welfare issues. So we're trying to avoid that and, and you know it's, we're looking at the long-term management of, of, um, of our chronic cases and that really includes both the workup uh, of these any new cases trying to trying to reach a specific diagnosis if we can uh, and then discussions on therapy with owners um, and institution of long-term treatment which is what I'm going to talk about uh, in the next webinar so yeah we're trying to find a new way of working and safety is of course the prime concern for all of us um, uh, so how are we doing that well I'm sure many, this is probably nothing new, but um, we have switched to doing video consultations for every case, um, whether that be a new case or a follow up. Um, and uh, we're using the video consult to triage those cases and decide which which ones need to be seen. And if they do need to be seen, then we're operating a locked door policy where clients with very rare exceptions, um, do not come into the, the practice at all. Um, they, the dog is handed over at the door. Um, and uh, if they, if, you know, what we found with, with dermatology, some of our cases is that actually a surprising number don't actually need to be seen. And we've been sending out little kits to clients uh, to do cytology, 
um, and we've put some videos on our website to show them how to take samples from their pets um, and send them into us. Um, and cytology being fundamentally important part of the workup of many uh, pruritic um, dogs and cats. So we post them out a sample. They take they they look at our our vid our website videos or Facebook. They're on Facebook as well, I think. Um, and they uh, chose them how to do it. They take the sample, stick it back in the box and post it back to us. So that's been quite a useful exercise. And of course, we've been remote prescribing as well. Um, so I'm going to, as we go through this tonight, I'll, you know, we'll talk a bit more about that. But that's, that's how, how we have moved over uh, in, this, in, in this change situation. And it's worked out surprisingly well. And I think there's no doubt that video consultations will be something that we will continue to do uh, into the future. It's something we've thought about doing for a long time. Um, we have patients that come from all over Scotland and the north of England, and to be able to follow them up with video consultation will be very um, useful uh, uh, and convenient for, for owners as well to avoid traveling. So. This webinar program, the first talk tonight, is kind of all about recognizing and, and it ultimately diagnosing canine atopic dermatitis, but it takes you through the workup of a pruritic dog. And, you know, I, I can only apologize and say that it's, it's not possible to uh, go through the workup of a pruritic dog in great detail um, in 45 minutes. Um, so uh, there, in some places it is a bit bare bones, um, but uh, please forgive me for that. Um, and then on the 27th of May, as Joe said, the next uh, webinar will be on the therapy of, of chronic pruritic uh, skin disease. So canine atopic dermatitis um, is a very common inflammatory skin disease um, that affects something around uh, 10 to 15 percent of the canine population so it's a really common condition and you think how many million dogs there are in the UK you know we're talking about huge numbers of cases um, and it presents a number of problems on a number of different levels it has a huge impact on both uh, our patients um, and also their owners so uh, Seventy-three percent of, of uh, owners felt that the disease, the atopic dermatitis of pruritus, affected their, their pet's quality of life. But half of them, very nearly half of them, felt that their own quality of life was impacted as well. And I think, especially now in this period of lockdown, uh, it can be quite awful for owners to be. Um, living with a pruritic pet that they feel they're unable to help and i think you know while pruritus may not be deemed as a life-threatening emergency um, it certainly uh, has major impacts on people's quality of life uh, and even more so at the moment atopic dermatitis is an incurable condition um, and uh, it, it is a ma one of the major reasons for owners vet hopping from uh, going from vet to vet to seek the elusive cure that really uh, doesn't exist. Um, and without proper education um, about this disease, um, owners will continue to vet hop. So it's something we need to spend time with them uh, discussing the disease. Um, uh, how we investigate and treat it, and uh, and, the lo and in particular the long-term management. And it, it is a difficult diagnosis at times. Uh, there is no specific test for atopic dermatitis. Um, and there are many causes for pruritus. Um, and um, I just want to remind, remind you of what those causes are in a second. But there isn't a single test that we can do that will say this particular patient has atopic dermatitis. It's a, as you'll see, it's a step by step process of ruling out other, all the many other pruritic 
diseases that we that could potentially be involved. So if we look at causes of pruritus, we can divide them into three main groups. So parasitic diseases, infections and allergies. There are other much less common um, conditions, um, um, but they, we would, they would tend to present in different ways, uh, with different clinical signs, different histories, uh, and uh, can occasionally mimic atopic disease, but would, would tend to be differentiated on clinical grounds. So when we're investigating pruritus, the always the first step is always to consider could the parasitic disease be involved. Um, um, we need to identify and treat any infections that could be contributing to pruritus before making a diagnosis of an allergic disease. Um, and then if we have other unusual clinical signs, they need to be investigated to rule out some of these other rarer conditions. So what is atopic dermatitis? We've talked about it, we've said it's a, an inflammatory pruritic skin disease, but you know, what actually is it? What's, what's causing it? Well, it's, it is highly complex. We know a lot more about this disease than we did when I started. It's a bit 30 odd years ago, but um, there's still a lot to learn. But this definition is the one that's been around since 2006, is the one that, that you'll see used in, in papers and textbooks and so on. And it is a genetically predisposed inflammatory and pruritic allergic skin disease. So it's genetic with characteristic clinical features. So it is recognizable clinically, generally speaking, associated with um, IgE antibodies, most commonly directed against environmental allergens. But you would also, you could also add food allergens in there as well. So these, this, this classic atopic dermatitis case would be a dog that would have this would, would, uh, have this pruritic inflammatory uh, skin disease where IgE antibodies could be identified either on intradermal testing or on uh, serological testing. But I also want to point out that, that there is a similar disease, an identical disease clinically, it cannot be differ differentiated clinically, where these dogs present in exactly the same way, but you cannot demonstrate IgE antibodies um, to environmental or other allergens on serology or on, on intradermal testing. And approximately 80% of dogs will, will, with this clinical phenotype, if you like, will fall into uh, this disease where they are positive on allergy testing, um, but 20% will fall into this, this group. Um, and that's why you know sometimes you you work up a, an atopic dog and you think oh this is you know happy with my diagnosis oh my allergy test is negative well it could be that it's falling into one of into this group here atopic it is a complex condition and and i i i try when i'm talking to clients about this disease i try and avoid actually using the word allergy because if they do fall into that 20% group, then it gets a bit confusing when you say this is an allergic skin disease, oh, but your dog is not allergic to anything. Um, and I, I think it's important to kind of try and give them some idea of what, it, what this disease involves. Uh, and so I'll start by saying to them that it is a, a, a underlying this condition it, is a, uh, the dog's genes. It is a genetic condition, um, and there are, there are also some interesting environmental factors that play a role too that that have yet to be fully elucidated. But uh, some interesting stuff there. And these genetic mutations have different effects. One effect is actually on the skin barrier function. So the skin, the epidermis, should form an effective barrier to the outside world. But in atopic dermatitis, it doesn't do that. I describe it to clients as a bit like a leaky raincoat. So things that can irritate and inflame the skin that are present in the environment can get in and, and 
cause inflammation and irritation, pruritus that way. And actually water leaks away from the skin surface, which dries the skin and can irritate as well. And, and if any of you have suffered from atopic dermatitis or you uh, know of any babies or children that have, you'll know that one of the treatments used is to smother their skin with emollients, uh, oils, uh, to moisturize the skin and address the skin barrier function problem. And then the other effect of these genetic mutations is immune dysregulation and um, an allergic response. And, um, and I can't go into more detail than that at this stage because it would take too long. But this is the 80% that we talked about in the last slide that are positive on allergy testing. So there's definitely an immune aspect to it and a barrier function aspect to it. Then there's the, inf the, the involvement of infection and many dogs with atopic dermatitis have um, a yeast and or um, staphylococcal infections um, that contribute to the, uh, the inflammation and pruritus and skin lesions. And we'll look at that in a second. And then there's the effect that scratching actually has. So when the dog scratches, um, it damages or uh, irritates the epidermis and the keratinocytes in the epidermis will release pro-inflammatory cytokines that further upregulate uh, inflammation. Um, and we talk about the scratch itch cycle that goes on. So it is a complex disease and it is more than just an allergic disease. So how do we diagnose atopic dermatitis? As I said earlier, unfortunately, there's no specific test that can be done. And just in case you think, well, that can't be right. What about all these allergy tests that, that we use? Well, unfortunately, these, uh, the specificity for these tests is very low. And there are many studies over the years that have demonstrated that, you know, um, you'll see positive reactions to dust and uh, um, intradermal injections of extracts of house dust and house dust mites in healthy dogs. Um, so 58% of healthy dogs were positive on in this study here on intradermal testing. Um, lots of normal dogs in this study here, um, a vast percentage of them were positive to DP is dermatophagoides um, teranosinus and DF is dermatophagoides Farini, the two important house dust mites. So, um, and here's another one which was done on healthy beagle, beagles where, um, and these were lab beagles that should have had minimal exposure to, to house dust mites. 21% of these lab beagles were positive to house dust mite uh, on um, IgE serology. So these are not tests that you can use to differentiate healthy from atopic dogs. Many healthy dogs, you know, probably half at least will have positive reactions um, uh, on sero serology and intradermal testing. And as we've already seen, around 20% of, uh, of atopic dogs will be negative on, on allergy testing. So what do we do? Well, it's a bit tedious and boring, I'm afraid, but it's like any other medicine case. It, 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 it is, there is no substitute for a step-by-step -step and fairly systematic approach which involves taking history, examining the dog, um, drawing up a differential diagnosis list, and then the first stages step is to uh, rule out any um, ectoparasitic disease that might be present on your differential diagnosis list, um, scrapes, plucks, and, and trial therapy, um, and then identification uh, and ruling out um, of uh, identification and treatment of any infection, and that's done by cytology uh, and, uh, and trial therapy. And actually, having done those three steps, you really have a clinical diagnosis of atopic dermatitis. You don't need to have a positive allergy test to say that the dog has, is likely to have this disease, provided the history and clinical signs are consistent um, with, uh, with atopic dermatitis. So history is really key uh, often to making a diagnosis. And one of the most important things is to establish the age at which the disease started. 
the age at which signs of pruritus started. And it's interesting. Um, well, actually, one thing I want to say before I start is these questions that I put up here are not an exhaustive history for a, a derm case. Um, we have one hour, initial one hour consultations in our practice, and probably I might spend 15 or 20 minutes of that one hour taking a, a very detailed history. But you could. These are the key questions I think you should ask, be asking, at least to start with, in any peritic dog. You no, know, in first opinion practice, you're not going to have the luxury of one hour consultation, and you may be doing this um, on video as well now. So um, these are the key questions to ask, and I think you should be able to go through these questions in just a few minutes, hopefully. So when did it start? The key is, the, the really important thing is the age of onset of atopic dermatitis. It's a disease that affects young dogs and the vast majority start with their signs between six months and three years of age. Some younger, some are older. But if you see disease starting in an older dog at six, seven, eight, nine, ten years of age, then that should raise alarm, ring an alarm bell um, uh, that you may be dealing with something else. There is a characteristic distribution of the pruritus, and I, I think it's important to ask owners which areas are affected. Not just an open-ended question, you know, where does he scratch, but say, does he rub his face? Does he shake his head or scratch his ears? Does he lick or chew or nibble his paws? Does he scratch or lick or nibble at his uh, undercarriage or whatever? Um, what lesions were present at the start? Initially, generally speaking, this is usually non-lesional pruritus to start with. I mean, occasionally a dog might present with a pyoderma as the first sign of, of, of uh, atopic, uh, atopic disease, but generally it's non-lesional. Um, and I, know if, I hope this little video is, will play. And when you're doing an examination, you can, of course, you may not be able to do, not going to, be able to do this on video, but this is a, a uh, this dog here is actually a, a young guide dog in training. Um, that presented with pruritus, you can see some alopecia around the eyes, but where this dog's particularly itchy, there are no uh, lesions at all. But you can see this, just tickling this dog's abdomen is inducing this uh, mark uh, scratch reflex. Um, if you go to other areas, the dog doesn't react. I do this with most pruritic dogs. It's, just, it, it's not perfect test, but it does give you an idea of which areas sometimes when you're examining them clinically, which areas are affected. And I guess you could ask an owner to do this on a, on a video console. Is there any seasonality? Often it's a, a, a seasonal problem in the UK to start with. So often they initially present around about this time of year, April, May time, and then they'll often get better uh, in the, the first autumn. So September, October, November this year, you might see an improvement and then inevitably the signs come back again next spring. And then typically in the UK, in, in our experience anyway, that the, the, the symptoms become year round. So initially it's seasonal, then it becomes a year round problem. Are there family members affected or um, other signs or, or contagion, signs of other uh, pets in the household affected? Um, that's a very, it's very helpful when there are positive signs of contagion, but don't rule out ectoparasitic disease um, just because no other family members or no, no other pets in the household are affected. And then response to therapy is a useful guide too, because generally speaking, most cases of atopic dermatitis are glucocorticoid responsive. And, you know, you could add in, like you could say, well, many of them are oclocitinib, uh, apoquil responsive and, or responsive to cytopoint as well. So if the, if you if there's a poor response to steroids, again that should ring alarm bells um, that you may be dealing with something else going on. It's not a hundred percent, you know. There are some cases that are just very refractory to treatment, but most are pretty steroid responsive. And I would say it's perfectly possible to take a good history on a video consult um, in this lockdown situation um, and. Those for me would be the key questions to ask uh, at an initial consultation. So the next stage is, is the examination and what you want, and, and actually you can do this from the history too, is, is establish the pattern of, 
of pruritus and possibly lesions. So you can see the classic distribution of atopic dermatitis is facial, so periocular, oral, muscle, groin, perineal, pedal, and axillae. You know, if this was chyletia, a dog with chyletiolosis, it might be very pruritic of the dorsal trunk. Or if it had scabies, it would be the pinnal, would be the pinnal margins, elbows, and hocks. So this overall distribution in dogs, at least, is a useful guide to the disease that you're dealing with. Having said that, there are breed recognized breed variations and, dis and subtle distinctions between, between dog breeds. So for example, if we look at the Sharpe here, they tend to be pruritic all over. German Shepherds often particularly badly affected over the groin and the paws. French Bulldogs are often very pruritic over the face. So you can see the key down here, so I perhaps should have explained this, I'm sorry, but light blue is rarely affected. Yellow is, you know, fairly frequently affected area. And then, you know, red would be 80 to 100% of that particular breed are affected in those areas. So you can see the, you know, uh, French Bulldogs and Boxers actually are very often pruritic over the face and so on. So that's an interesting thing to have a look at. Westies chew their paws a lot and they tend to be quite often pruritic over the dorsal trunk. So there are these subtle breed variations, but the classic presentation is, is this one here on the left. So clinical signs, and I, I, we found yeah, the Zoom consultations that we've been doing, these video consults, I, I, they are useful. You can get a general impression of how the, the dog looks, uh, areas of hair loss. Sometimes if the owners are quite skilled with their phones and their, and their cameras, they can show you close-ups of lesions, but you can get an overall impression of, of, of many of the, uh, of some of the signs at least. But you do have to be careful because you know the camera can lie a little bit, and you know we have noticed sometimes when you see a, a case face to face, you think, right, that's not quite my, the impression I I drew of it when I when I when we did the initial video consult. But early stage atopic dermatitis would be just mild erith periocular erythema, mild erythema of the muzzle, uh, and then you might progress to more uh, severe lesions with some hair loss here. This will be due to self-trauma. Um, pedal erythema is a common finding. I mean, this could be malassezia dermatitis in here, but uh, equally many atopic dogs are quite erythematous between the foot pads and digits. And then more chronic lesions. Um, notice here how this, the, 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 this pigmentation here, which is a sign of chronicity, um, so some lichenifications and thickening of the skin. Uh, the teats are quite enlarged, and this is due to self-trauma. And you can tell this is not an endocrinopathy or anything, um, a sex hormone imbalance, because it's just this, the forward two pairs of teats here that are enlarged, the caudal ones are not. And this is because the dog rubs its ventrum and is causing teat enlargement uh, due to self-trauma. Uh, and then very chronic, very severe cases. And these are ones that we're trying to avoid in this lock lockdown period or trying to avoid all our patients turning into one of these cases where you've got very severe chronic uh, inflammatory changes with scarring um, uh, and a lot of, a lot of uh, lichenification, pigmentation, um, probably heavy, heavy colonization of the skin with, with yeast and or bacteria. So infection is uh, a, an, a very important cause of pruritus, um, both in atopic dermatitis and secondary to other diseases too. Uh, these are infections caused by staphylococci, staph sued intermediates, and malassezia. And the reason that atopic dogs are, are um, predisposed to these infections is due to heavy colonization um, of their skin with uh, these organisms. And that's due to increased adherence of the organisms to the skin cells. Remember, these are uh, resident organisms and um, bacteria and yeast. They're part of the normal skin microbiome, um, but their numbers dramatically can dramatically increase in 
in any disease that alters the microclimate on the skin surface, but atopic dermatitis being a very common cause of this. And uh, so there's a high incidence of um, pyoderma and malassezia dermatitis. So we've got German Shepherd here with this papular and um, uh, macular um, eruption consistent with a cholerets consistent with a superficial pyoderma. And this dog, this Labrador here that's busy scratching herself, she has severe generalized malassezia dermatitis. So the, these yeast and bacterial infections are a cause of um, uh, additional skin lesions in atopic disease. Um, and they also dramatically contribute to pruritus. Uh, and both by just uh, the, the uh, inflammatory effect of the lesion, but also hypersensitivity reactions in some cases. So this dog here, this Labrador, this is the, this dog's allergy test, and this is a positive reaction to malassezia. So not only does this dog have a severe generalized malassezia dermatitis, uh, she also had a malassezia hypersensitivity. And when we're working up pruritic dogs um, and trying to make a diagnosis of atopic dermatitis, these secondary infections often mask the subtle underlying signs of atopic disease. And it's really important to treat these infections before proceeding with the likes of a, a, a diet trial. Um, uh, because otherwise you won't be able to tell what effect the diet trial is having on the dog if they still have a skin infection. And they're also a very common reason for poor response to uh, many of the drugs and treatments that we use to control pruritus, uh, chronic pruritus. So steroids, you know, oftalocitinib, apoquil, uh, lokivetmab, side point, obviously, if, you, if your patient's not responding to one of those drugs, then suspect infection could be involved. Otitis externa is really common in atopic dermatitis. Um, and, you know, a dog that presents with, a young dog presenting with recurring otitis, you know, atopic dermatitis is uh, top of the list of primary causes um, for that dog's ear disease. Um, and in fact, some atopic dogs present just with otitis externa and no other signs at all. And it may be very mild changes, uh, just some erythema around the ear canal um, to more severe if you start to get secondary yeast or bacterial infections um, with discharge and perhaps malodor and then very chronic changes and long-standing poorly managed atopic disease. So where we are, where are we with this? Well, we've done the history, we've, we've uh, taken a history, we've examined the dog. Um, we our next step is to, uh, we've drawn up a differential diagnosis list and our next step is to rule out any um, parasitic diseases and identify and treat infections. So how do we rule out ectoparasitic disease? Well, it's, it is beyond the scope of this lecture to, to go through ectoparasitic disease in any detail, but things like flea combings, coat brushings, this is a coat brushing where, I, where I'm brushing the dog's hair coat onto a piece of paper and then I'll fold the paper and tap, uh, just tap it gently so the material falls down into the crease. And I'll pick that up on a piece of tape and stick it to a microscope slide and examine it under the low power light microscope. And it's a great way of finding small fragments of flea feces or uh, things like chylatiella or lice that you wouldn't see uh, necessarily just on gross um, examination of the hair coat. Um, skin scrapes, uh, important if you suspect, um, Demodicosis or scabies. This is a rather unusual case here. This is a Shih Tzu, one of a group of dogs that we saw a few years ago uh, with severe facial pruritus. And on skin scraping the dog's face, you could find these large demodex mites. This is a mite called demodex ingi um, that is less well known than the demodex canis that most of us are used to dealing with. If ectoparasitic disease is present on your, and if an ectoparasitic disease is present on your differential diagnosis list, um, and you do skin scrapes and coat brushings um, and examine them carefully, with the exception of demodicosis, uh, trial therapy should be the next step. So not finding evidence of chylatiella, not finding evidence of scabies mites, not finding evidence of fleas, etc 
uh, is an indication for effective trial therapy. And now that we have the isoxazolines, there's no real reason not to do this. Um, you know, we have very effective and convenient ways of of uh, ruling out ectoparasitic disease. Um, so yeah, trial therapy where required. Um, do the cytology. You know, if you see lesions spots or areas of erythema or greasy discharge or um you know areas of hair loss with scaling um then tape strips or direct impressions to look for yeast and bacterial infections are uh, really important and this is where we are you know we have been sending out little kits for owners to to use at home um and uh, they're sending them back into us so we can look and see if there's evidence of yeast or bacterial infection. We don't do that with every case, but we do do it with cases where we suspect there's an infection present and we would like to try and confirm that that's the case. Yeah. So when we, I have, it, it, you know, it's difficult to treat, to talk much about, again, about treating these infections, but most cases of superficial pyoderma uh, and malassezia dermatitis, we would tend to treat topically. Um, and that might be with a chlorhexidine shampoo used two or three times a week, and then have the owner use the likes of a, it might be a wipe or a chlorhexidine based wipe or a chlorhexidine based mousse, for example, on the days that the dog's not been shampooed and that's a bit empirical but in in our hands in our practice that works well and rarely do we have to resort to systemic antibiotics um so that would be how we we treat these infections and if having done that the dog is still pruritic and the clinical signs and history are consistent with atopic dermatitis then you have a clinical diagnosis of atopic dermatitis at that point. And it's at that stage that we would discuss with the owner um, the next steps in terms of the benefits or pros and cons of doing allergy testing and further investigations to identify specific allergens and also the treatment options for this disease. So, in most cases of non-seasonal pruritus, um, we like to rule out food-induced atopic dermatitis. So these are atopic dogs that are presenting with uh, uh, exactly the same clinical signs as any other atopic dog, but they are. Uh, we, we like to rule out the involvement of food allergens. So, um, and we would only tend to do that in obviously non-seasonal pruritus with rare exceptions. So if your dog is just pruritic in the summertime and receives has the same diet all year round, then um, it's very unlikely that they will be food allergic. Is serology of value in diagnosing food-induced atopic dermatitis? Well, uh, everybody accepts that there is no substitute for a proper elimination diet trial, but serology may be of value um, when it comes to selecting which foods uh, you might use for a diet trial. Uh, in other words, it makes sense to select a protein to which the dog does not have an IgE um, antibody response. So how do we do diet trials? Well, that's that's a, that's a subject of another hour's lecture really, but I'm gonna cover it very quickly for you in one slide. Essentially, we you make the assumption that the dog must be allergic or reactive to foods that he's currently being fed or has been fed in the past so what we want to do is to feed a diet containing a protein and or a carbohydrate to which the dog sorry a protein uh, and ideally a carbohydrate to which the dog has not been previously exposed we feed that diet for six to eight weeks um, and assess the response so which diet could you use? Well, there are different options. Novel, <coughs> novel protein diets, i.e. a protein to which the dog has not previously been exposed, used to be the way that we would uh, do diet trials. And typically, you know, going back 15, 20 years, we would have done home cooked diet trials. 
whether the owner cooks ingredients at home, pork and potatoes, the one that we use more than any any other one. But owners rarely have time to do uh, all the spud peeling and prep food preparation nowadays. Um, and, and so we do home cooked diets, I would say almost never now. Um, we do sometimes select proprietary diets with specific proteins in them. Um, uh, and there are, as you know, a whole range of that diet, those diets on the market. The one thing I would say is now in most, most studies have demonstrated, or sorry, several studies have demonstrated that most foods still contain other protein sources to that which is labeled on the package. So, um, you know, it may say salmon and rice, but there's a pretty good chance it's got other protein sources in there as well. Nowadays, uh, especially with the difficulty of selecting uh, a novel protein, we tend to use hydrolyzed diets. And the advice is that if you're feeding a hydrolyzed diet, you want to use a novel parent protein source, <coughs> i.e., you know, don't use a chicken hydrolysate in a dog that's already fed chicken because the hydrolysis may not be sufficiently uh, effective to prevent that dog from reacting to the diet if it is chicken allergic. So use a novel parent protein source if you're feeding a hydrolyzed diet. But hydrolyzed diets are where we tend to go now um, with most uh, diet trials. Give the owner written instructions rather than just telling them what to do. They tend to take that in better in my experience. Um, and I think Joe's just mentioned mentioned in the introduction that Evact have produced some literature on this that may be very helpful. Um, it's important to control pruritus and infections during the diet trial. So if the dog has a yeast or bacterial infection, you won't see any response to the diet trial. Control the infection first, to establish a baseline level of pruritus and then continue to control the infection throughout the diet trial. So all you're evaluating is the, is the, under, the underlying pruritus associated with the allergic disease. Um, and if the dog is very pruritic, despite management of the infection, then manage the pruritus as well. So crisis busting medication is required. We'll often give the owner a supply of uh, you know, it could be oxycitinib pills or it could be tablets or it could be steroid tablets and say to them, if your dog's very itchy, give these for three days. Don't give them continuously because we won't be able to tell what effect the diet's having. But um, you, if, you, if it gets very itchy, give them these for three days and that should be sufficient to settle the itch down. And, you know, you can repeat that once a week or once a fortnight if you have to. Reevaluate the dog yourself. If you see a 50% or more reduction in pruritus, then consider that significant and challenge them with the original food because the improvement may be due to treatment of infection or longer term treatment of a flea, effect of long term flea control or very importantly season. If you start doing a diet trial in September, you know, there's a very good chance the dog would have got better anyway by October or November. So challenge them. And the pruritus should recur, certainly within a week to 10 days um, when you put them back on the original food. So if your dog's not food allergic, uh, the implication of that is that they're going to require lifelong management. And um, in, in those cases, one option for lifelong management is uh, allergen specific immunotherapy. And that's the principal reason that we do allergy testing, so intradermal testing or serology. We're using these tests to identify uh, allergens uh, to which the dog is reactive for inclusion in an immunotherapy vaccine uh, or for the purposes of allergen avoidance. That's probably a secondary consideration. These are not tests for atopic dermatitis, as I've already discussed. And people often ask, which is the best test? You know, should we do intradermal testing or should we refer the dog for intradermal testing or should we do a blood test? Um, and, you know, it absolutely depends on a whole load of factors. But if you do do serological test and you get results, 
that correlate well with that dog's history, i.e., you know, if you have a non-seasonally pruritic dog, a dog that's pruritic all year round and it reacts to two or three grass pollens, that doesn't it doesn't offer a good explanation for why that dog is pruritic in December and January. So look at the history. If the if the dog's history correlates well with the results of your serological test, then have confidence in the results of that test, and you can use that to formulate. Uh, immunotherapy treatment. If it doesn't make sense, then it's worth considering uh, sending that dog for intradermal testing. So what are the pitfalls of diagnosis of these cases? Um, well, uh, pruritus in general, really. One is an over-reliance on allergy testing. We'll look at an example of that in a second. Um, two, there isn't really a formulated diagnostic plan. And I, I look at these um, I look at case histories every day of the week I'm working really, and you can kind of see like, oh, you really, you know, there was no, it hadn't been set out the direction that they were going in. So um, have a diagnostic plan, you know, rule out parasitic disease, identify and treat infections before you do, do you try a diet trial or, or do allergy testing. Missing microbial involvement is a big one. So this this cocker spaniel, it is a topic, but it's covered in malassezia, um, and that's what's that's really what's mainly making the dog pruritic. Failure to control severe clinical signs, so manage the pruritus during a diet trial. Case continuity, um, you know, try and follow the case through yourself. It's not always easy with, in big practices, but, uh, and also kind of like recognize when you've got to the point where you've made a diagnosis, you know, um, and, and then, you know, discuss it with the owner and discuss the implications of the diagnosis, and we'll talk about treatment in the in the next uh, presentation. And then there are these rare, unusual presentations of pruritus that get mis mistaken for other diseases. So I just want to finish up. I don't know how we're doing for time, actually. Probably uh, time is marching on, I suspect. But I, I'm I'm just going to um, go through some some cases with you, some pruritic cases with you. Uh, and uh, there's just three of them, and it shouldn't take long, so hopefully you'll bear with me. Um, yeah, so this is Eula, who's a nine-year-old female neutered German Shepherd, and she's presented with marked dorsal pruritus for the past six months. Well, straight away, this is a dog whose disease started at eight and a half years of age, and it's dorsal pruritus. That's not a feature of atopic dermatitis. She had no previous history of skin disease, and there was a rather poor response to steroids and um, Apoquil. She gets some flea control, but um, it's kind of intermittent with uh, using fipronil. No zoonosis, no evidence of contagion. She doesn't have contact with other dogs or cats. And when you look at her, paws look normal, ventrum looks normal. But when you look at the dorsal trunk, you can see there are areas of erythema, a little bit of uh, maybe a little bit of crusting there. Um, and she's very pruritic over the dorsal trunk, doing this little digital stimulation test. So what's the differential here? Well, primarily uh, it's causes of, we're looking for causes of dorsal pruritus. Which things cause, cause dorsal pruritus? Well, chyletiolosis. Flea allergy dermatitis, Demodex ingi infestation, but that's not, it does cause dorsal pruritus. That's mainly in terriers, you know, so Westies and Fox terriers and Border terriers. Um, so probably less likely. But pyoderma very definitely can be, could, could be causing those erythematous lesions over the dorsal trunk. So we do some skin scrapes and coat brushings, nothing to be found. Um, what do we do then? Well, uh, we definitely want to do to rule out ectoparasitic disease with this dog. So if we find nothing on skin scrapes and coat brushings, but that doesn't mean there's nothing there. So we treat with uh, nowadays with an isoxazoline um, and probably treat the house environment. And this dog completely responded um, <coughs> and the pruritus had resolved after six weeks. I saw a very similar case to this. I don't have photographs of, but it was in a collie just oh, about a month ago when I was uh, holding the fort, and it was done as a, a Zoom, initial Zoom video consultation. 
didn't examine the dog face to face. We dispensed um, a fox Elena, uh, and that I uh, did a follow up Zoom consult with the lady three or four weeks later, and the dog was completely uh, better. So that dog would have definitely fallen into this category. I actually did send her out a little kit to take some coat brushing samples that duly arrived in the post, uh, probably almost by the time we did the follow-up consultation to, or just a few days before. Uh, I didn't find anything on those samples, but um, yeah, uh, this is a good example of a one that you can you can address very well without having to see the dog necessarily face to face at all. This is Jenny, two year old. You've seen some pictures of her already in this talk, and I, I kind of use I, I use this case quite a lot really over the years, um, and I think it's on our website too. But I make no apology because it's, it's a it's a nice case. So this is a two year old neuter female Westie. 18 month with generalized glucocorticoid responsive pruritus. Now that does sound like she probably is a, you know, a good chance she is atopic. It started at six months of age and it's very steroid responsive. She does get, sorry, she does get um, some monthly fipronil. Uh, she's had several hypoallergenic diets, according to Fiona. You know, you, you mention diet to them and they say, oh no, it can't be food allergy. We've, we've, she doesn't respond to hypoallergenic diets. Well, just like to remind everybody that hypoallergenic is a completely meaningless term. It's only it's only hypoallergenic if you're not allergic to it, um, or and then it really should be an allergenic, I suppose. But um, and there, this dog had had a serological um, blood test for uh, environmental allergens and had um, tested positive to house dust mites and had been started on allergen immunotherapy based on the results of that test. But uh, this is how she looked after a year of allergen immunotherapy, clearly not doing very well. So differential diagnosis, we always think of parasitic disease first. So demidicosis could certainly cause that extensive alopecia. This dog's very pruritic, could be scabies, could be chyletiella. Um, Certainly, the skin is inflamed, kind of chronically inflamed and a bit like kenified. So there could be a malassezia infection going on. There could be a bacterial overgrowth. Um, certainly, she could be atopic. Uh, she could have a flea allergy, dermatitis. So we do a bunch of skin scrapes, nothing to find. On cytology, you could see both yeast. These are these ghost forms of malassezia that you can see here, and also coccoid bacteria. Um, so there's definitely evidence of yeast and bacterial infection. So the first stage is to uh, treat, rule, thoroughly rule out ectoparasitic disease and treat these infections. And after four weeks, she was definitely improved. You can see the skin looks a lot better, but she's still obviously pruritic. Um, so we've gotten rid of the infection, that's made a difference, but she is still itchy. And a, and a diet trial is the next step. Uh, and she was actually, this is an old case, and this dog was in fact fed a home cooked diet trial of pork and potato. Um, and after three months, this is how she looked. So this dog certainly, and she relapsed on diet challenge too. So this dog certainly had a food allergy. So don't rely on the results of allergy testing to make a diagnosis is the, is the bottom line here. In the last case, Stay with me uh, is Alicia, another Westie. And this is a three year old uh, spayed female Westie with an eight month history of non seasonal facial, pedal, and ventral pruritus. And on this occasion, she has some quite severe lesions in the groin and in the axillae. And these are very chronic uh, areas of inflammation where the skin's become pigmented uh, and lichenified. Um, she also has episodes of otitis externa. So, again, she sounds like she could be atopic, but on this occasion, she has a very poor response to steroids and oclocitinib. And she's had repeated courses of, of systemic antibiotic treatment, which hasn't helped. Initial tests, well, it's the usual ones. Skin scrapes and coat brushings were negative. On cytology, you could see, this is a tape strip cytology, and you don't have neutrophils, phagocytosing bacteria here, but what you have is a skin cell here, I um, hope everybody can see my mouse. 
um, a skin cell here in the center. These are skin cells here and here, and this is a hair shell. Uh, and on this skin cell, there are many cocci, which are adhering just to the cell. So this is what we call bacterial overgrowth. Um, and this is another uh, one. This is less obvious. You have to look carefully to see these, but this is a, uh, a, a sheet of squames here, ker keratinocytes. Uh, and you can see dotted over them here, there are these coccoid bacteria. Not lots of them, but enough to say, definitely need to treat that and see what's happening. So we treat the uh, infection um, with shampoos and on this occasion wipes, um, and we rule out ectoparasitic disease. Um, and, and after four to six weeks, this dog's looking a lot better. Um, the, the hair's definitely regrowing, um, and the skin is markedly improved um, and there's no evidence of infection on repeat cytology but she's still pruritic uh, and so the next step is a diet trial and there was no response um, and at that stage we did intradermal testing and she was positive to dust and storage mites and long so that you know we can confirm a diagnosis of atopic dermatitis associated with house dust mite allergy um, and she was started on a combination of allergen immunotherapy and, and shampoo therapy that was effective in managing colitis. So atopic, uh, just to finish up, atopic dermatitis is more than just an allergy. Um, it's associated with barrier function defects, uh, immune dysregulation leading to sensitization to environmental and or food and or microbial um, allergens. Um, and infection plays an important role in this disease as well. And for any pruritic dog, um, a, we, you know, we need this systematic workup with history, uh, clinical signs, ruling out of other pruritic skin diseases, so ruling out parasitic disease, identification and treatment of infections before moving on to do diet trials and, and uh, allergy tests. So elimination diet trials of non-seasonal pruritus, um, and uh, allergy testing, really the main reason is to select allergens for immunotherapy and perhaps for avoidance of allergens. And we've talked about the intradermal versus serum um, in vitro uh, testing. And, you know, history taking, a basic examination, cytology and diet trials are all potentially possible uh, during this lockdown period without necessarily having to see the dog face to face. But there will be cases where you look at them and you think those are unusual lesions or I really need to get some tired cytology from this or this dog needs some skin scrapes done, in which case you will need to have the dog in for an examination. And if you want more information on this, I can really recommend this article. It's five years old now, but it's still very uh, pertinent, um, a really nice uh, guidelines on the diagnosis uh, and allergen identification in canine atopic dermatitis. So it does take you through the workup of a, of a fruit of a really, a really nice paper.